Hi everyone, I am Karen Iwichow. I'm an environmental technician and land manager with the Land Conservancy of BC. I am currently um, presenting uh, this presentation on the shared, asserted, and unceded lands of the Wasanic, Songhees, and Esquimalt peoples whose historical relationship uh, continues to this day. I would like to also acknowledge the privilege of being able to work and um, live and play and learn um, on, on, the, on these lands. Um, I believe it's uh, important for all of us um, to know whose land we're standing on and to go beyond that performative um, sort of task of you know, making this territorial acknowledgement. Um, I'm very appreciative of being here and, and, and learning more each day and, and, and building these relationships with the land and, and with the peoples. So welcome uh, to this uh, Passport to Nature event. This is the first of one in three, and let's begin. So I just want to share a little bit about who TLC is. So we are a nonprofit charitable land trust working throughout BC. Um, TLC protects important habitat for plants, animals, natural communities, as well as properties with historical, cultural, scientific, and scenic and compatible recreational values. Uh, so we were founded in two, ooh, 1997. Uh, we are a democratic uh, organization. We are member cert based and governed by an elected board of directors. Our programs that we have cannot run without our incredible members and donors, and you can become a member of TLC for just as little as $3 a month. Um, so if you want to learn more about becoming a member, uh, please check our website or give our office a call and talk to our fabulous Lisa Cross. So TLC uh, does um, our incredible work through uh, three different programs, which is through Conservation Covenants, which is where uh, myself and our biologist, Tori Archer, um, work within in Conservation Covenants. Um, we have uh, programs through education and outreach and acquisition. Conservation Covenants is the program that I spend most of my time working within. Um, we have about 243, I think 44. Um, we have 11 on the go. Uh, <laughs> we're quite busy here. Um, our, all our covenants put together uh, protect about 13,000 uh, acres of land across the province, and about 15% of, of those are on public lands, um, which include places like public parks um, and uh, retreats and uh, farms. Um, so a lot of my job is actually monitoring these covenants, and we have an annual obligation to um, ensure these agreements are uh, within compliance, as well as ensuring that the ecology of these places are in a, a good and happy uh, place. Uh, oftentimes, um, a lot of our uh, work is, is in uh, doing restoration and getting rid of those invasive species so we can um, provide opportunities for uh, biodiversity and native biodiversity to thrive, especially in the face of climate change. Um, these give us uh, an incredible uh, opportunity for the community to get involved. Uh, mostly university students like to come out with us and learn more about um, what conservation uh, covenants do and, 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 and you know, things that associate with that. So our education outreach uh, comprises of two uh, main uh, projects, which is uh, Passport to Nature, which uh, this presentation is part of. Um, this is uh, free events throughout the year to engage our community and members um, in different ways uh, with the natural world. Uh, so, so far this year, we had a talk on lichens and invasive species. And uh, coming up later this fall, we'll have uh, a moss identification and something on fungus. Um, so this is a really great way um, to, to learn more about nature. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, with COVID, um, we had to put this online this year. Um, I've been enjoying doing it this way. We actually um, been reaching people in further places than we would have we met on the ground. So I uh, embrace that opportunity. Um, but also um, one of my favorite programs that we started here is called the Deer Trails Naturalist Program. And I highly encourage you to check that one out. 
Um, Deer Trails is an intergenerational place-based learning opportunity designed to facilitate the transfer of naturalist knowledge, uh, both scientific and traditional. So we're talking like mandolin and the microscope, uh, arts and science mixed together. Um, and we started this program back in 2019. Um, and it's a one week intensive up in the Clearwater Valley uh, with some incredible seasoned naturalists. And uh, we'll be running our next session this August. Uh, fingers crossed that, um, you know, things are still uh, looking good on the pandemic front and uh, we're, we're, we're coming out of that and we can gather again. So what is nature journaling? Uh, nature journaling is the process of recording your observations about the natural world on paper. And um, yeah, I, as this is sort of something that I got really interested in um, as I learned about nature journaling and it blew my mind. I didn't really put together that much of what we know today in the natural world actually comes from journal entries of um, naturalists and scientists. So, I mean, this goes all the way back to Aristotle. Um, you can even talk about um, Galileo and his, you know, works that basically spark the modern age of what we understand of ast uh, astronomy. And so I have a picture here of his journals. And so he, um, you know, through his journaling and his observations recorded the moon and found out the moon has cycles, you know, our moon and the moon around Jupiter and Venus and, 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 it, and many more discoveries. And this was through uh, nature journaling. I saw this quote the other day and thought it was really fitting to um, kind of explaining uh, what my interest and curiosity around uh, nature journaling is. Uh, about so uh, man is not himself only he is all that he sees all that flows to him from a thousand sources he is the land the lift of its mountain lines and the reach of, a of its valleys um, and that was written by Mary Hunter Austin and nature journaling are there's so many different things and writing is one way to express it um, so a little bit about uh, this really, really interesting uh, naturalist. Her name was Mary Hunter Austin. She was born in the States in uh, 1868. She was a writer best known for um, her book called The Land of Little Rain, which describes the fauna flora and those connections um, that people have um, with mysticism and spirituality. Uh, she studied the lives of indigenous peoples in the Mojave Desert for almost 20 years. Um, so her book, uh, The Land of Little Rain is a collection of short stories and essays detailing landscapes and the inhabitants of the uh, American Southwest. And through those uh, short stories, uh, she tells uh, messages of environmental conservation and a philosophy of cultural and social, social political uh, regionalism that links all those stories together. Um, so you want to learn more about her and her time spent in the desert and learning about those cultures and the way the land moves about, I highly recommend checking her out. Karen, the naturalist. That's me. So I am just want to take a minute here and uh, talk about my interest in nature journaling and why I'm doing this series. Um, Nature's always been a part of my life, even though I never really recognized its value until I moved out west and felt my first earthquake. And that kind of took me out of working in commercial photography, doing weddings and portraits and things like that, into studying geology and then moving my way uh, into working in conservation. Um, I always wanted to draw. I couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> but it wasn't actually until uh, I was facilitating or helping facilitating uh, the Deer Trails Naturalist program where Bryony Penn and Lynn Baldwin were teaching the participants about nature journaling and I just, it just, just fit. It was just right. It was perfect. I love it. It's such a wonderful way for me to sort of quietly get closer to nature. Um, drawing things uh, helps me uh, learn more about what I'm drawing, you know, they're 
your connections in the world and uh, actually like even just things like identifying birds now sure I draw it and I when I see the next the bird the next time it's like oh I know exactly what that is because I drew you know this color on his wing and he's got this little hat on or whatnot so um, yeah it's been a really fun way to uh, connect not only with my own uh, creativity and interest and curiosities um, but also with other people and I want to share this uh, naturalism so this is the uh, philosophy um, of naturalism this is the idea that only natural laws and forces operate in the universe so this is the tendency um, that essentially is looking upon nature as one of the original and fundamental sources of all that exists in an attempt to explain everything in terms of nature so um, either the limits of nature are also the limits of existing reality or at its least the first cause um, if its existence is found necessary and found nothing to do with uh, the working of natural agency. So um, all events, therefore, uh, find their adequate explanation within nature itself. But as the terms of nature and natural are themselves used in more than one sense, the term naturalism kind of has far from more than one fixed meaning. Um, <laughs> this makes me uh, laugh because often when I talk about naturalism, people think I'm talking about naturalism um, in, in that, uh, you know, those folks that enjoy being in the nude uh, and quite often in nature, so it's not uh, too far deviating, but uh, most of the time, <laughs> all the time, <laughs> I'm talking about uh, naturalism and in, in in that uh, natural laws and, and how that operates in the universe. Um, historically, where these ideas came from was uh, sort of in uh, the Western and uh, more Western from you know Greeks to to North America um, that influenced um, the folks that I'm going to speak about uh, next, but um, it was the ancient Greek philosophies that were kind of yeah dating those um, those ideas. But um, there has been some ideas in the East um, going back to like two or three BCE and. Um, and those are in some schools of Hinduism. So if I can pronounce uh, this right, the Sam, Sam, Sam Kaya is one of the oldest schools of Indian philosophy that puts nature as its primary cause in the universe without assuming the existence of a personal God. So it's kind of interesting to um, learn about uh, different cultures um, practicing these kind of same ideas here. So naturalism kind of influences us um, to to nature journal our our curiosity and our interest in the natural world and those laws is sort of what drives us uh, to to record these observations through different ways if it's writing um, poetry or essays or uh, drawing pictures or pressing plants or recording you know when the moon is setting every night um, it's been this way to develop a um, to develop the scientific method. I mean, essentially, the scientific method is these rigorous, uh, um, quantitative, uh, you know, observations that we make um, inferences from. Uh, yeah, and uh, I put this quote in here for uh, Trevor Goward, one of my favorite naturalists, um, because he 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 has a connection with um, Tolkien's uh, stories in the natural world. I can't talk about uh, nature journaling without uh, just, you know, giving a little nod to Charles Darwin, uh, because as we know, you know, he he was the essentially, you know, the father of, you know, modern biology and evolutionary science. Um, he was born in 1809. He spent his life, uh, you know, being curious about the natural world. Uh, it kind of I mean, he was supposed to be a, uh, a doctor like his father, but instead he kind of hopped on, uh, uh, on a ship and traveled across the world and, and studied, you know, plants and animals and, and recorded those observations through uh, drawings and journal writings and, um, and, of course, taking lots of samples. Um, 
So these are some of his pictures um, that he drew from his um, books there. I actually couldn't find too much um, on his journal entries and things like that, so which is kind of unfortunate. But um, yeah, it kind of gives you an idea uh, that uh, a lot of uh, scientific understanding comes from uh, you know drawing your observations out. Robert Bateman. Uh, so here's our first Canadian uh, naturalist that I'd like to talk about. Um, so Robert Bateman was born in 1930. Uh, he now resides on Salt Spring Island, um, but uh, he grew up uh, in the Toronto area, I believe around Mississauga, and he spent a lot of his childhood wandering around in those uh, in those forests and along uh, the escarpment. That's actually where I grew up as well, um, in southern Ontario there. So I'm familiar with the uh, um, those places. Um, yeah, he always had uh, been drawing things, uh, not necessarily in the style of, uh, I think, what they call realism, but more um, kind of artistic. And uh, he actually became a high school teacher in art and geography, but uh, continued, you know, doing these, um, these nature journalings, uh, you know, um, throughout that time and he did that for about 20 years before he uh, committed his time full-time uh, to art and, and painting um, in 1976. Um, I have some uh, of his journal um, entries in the next couple slides that I just want to show you but um, Robert Bateman is just a incredible um, inspiration. He has made a life of um, using his work in, in, in his paintings and in nature journaling to promote uh, conservation and bring awareness to the needs that we have uh, in that respect there. And um, just in 1999, the Audubon Society of Canada declared Bateman one of the top 100 environmental proponents of the 20th century, which is a pretty awesome title um, in my mind. Um, so these days he's a uh, spokesman, spokesman um, for many environmental and uh, preservation issues. He uses his art to raise funds for these causes. And uh, his art reflects the commitment to ecology and preservation. And uh, yeah, since the 60s, he's been an active member of naturalist and conservation organizations on a global scale. Um, So these are a couple of examples of um, Robert Bateman's uh, work in his uh, nature journal. And uh, thing, you know, everyone's uh, journal looks different. Some people write, some people draw, some people draw um, or paint. Um, these look like they're, yeah, pencil um, sketches there. And uh, yeah, beautiful. You know, we can do these in, in pencil as well. If you just have a pencil and paper out in the field. So uh, this picture I couldn't really fit into my slide properly here, but it kind of gives you the idea. And this is uh, something that I really, really love um, about Robert Bateman and all the other naturalists and artists that uh, participated in, in this project. And this was part, so this, these pictures are depicting uh, the Carmana Valley, which is um, sort of on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And they are home to one of the most beautiful, largest, giant old old trees and um, we love our resource extraction so um, back in the 80s um, uh, there was a group um, of artists including uh, Robert Bateman who went out there to to uh, to draw and paint and write about this place and share that with everyone to to express how special this place is and, and, and the value of it and why it should be saved. And uh, I, I, if I remember this correctly, um, if you look at the top there and um, to the right and you see next to those trees, I think that's Robert Bateman who painted himself into it. And I think he was talking about how um, that perspective, um, you know, the person in there um, helped really bring to the front of like how big and massive and beautiful these places are. So, so, you know, nature journaling can just be a hobby in your, your, you know, for yourself and your own interests, but it also can play a huge role in, in expressing, you know, um, these important values that these places hold. 
John Muir, another awesome uh, naturalist and activist. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, uh, his work, at least uh, some of his most popular quotes, uh, like the one I have here, the mountains are calling and I must go. Um, they certainly were, and he did go. Um, John Muir was born in 1838 and he was known as the father of national parks, and he was an influential uh, Scottish-American naturalist, author, environmental philosopher, uh, botanist, zoologist, glaciologist, and early advocate for preserving uh, wild spaces in the United States. Uh, he was born in Scotland, was a sibling to seven uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, the family immigrated into the States, where uh, he attended university in Wisconsin, and he studied all the subjects um, that I mentioned just earlier here. And, but never actually obtained a degree, and he, yeah, I think uh, he was quoted saying something like, it's not, it's not about the title, it's more just about the knowing and the understanding of these different subjects, so I thought that was really, really interesting. Uh, he actually spent some time in southern Ontario, much like uh, Robert Bateman, uh, in, in around Georgian Bay and around the escarpment, um, because he was, he drafted the, uh, or dodged the draft, uh, for the Civil War before returning back to the States. Um, and uh, he worked in a wagon wheel factory in, in Indianapolis uh, where he actually had an accident with some uh, metal bit going through his eyes and I think something not pretty um, and was actually almost blinded and, and that experience kind of drove him to, I gotta, I gotta spend my time in nature and learn as much as I can about it and, and not work in these factory settings. So he actually... Uh, uh, did a huge hike <laughs> from uh, Kentucky down to Florida and then spent some time in Cuba uh, before he went back to New York and then settled out in California. And, um, and yeah, I mean, he's somebody who has written essays and uh, letters. I think he's published like 200 articles and a dozen books on, on subjects uh, around, uh, you know, Yosemite and uh, Sequoia National Parks, I mean, his writings um, sparked, um, you know, the activism and the, the interest to, to preserve these spaces. And uh, most notably, he also co-founded the Sierra Club, uh, who, uh, which is an organization that continues today uh, in preserving uh, uh, natural spaces. Bryony Penn is, uh, I have to say, probably one of my favorite naturalists, as her work inspired me personally quite a bit. Um, she is a fifth generation uh, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, <laughs> Vancouver Islander who lives on Salt Spring Island and she's a writer, artist, educator, naturalist, it's just so many things. Um, <laughs> um, but for me, her, um, her uh, artwork is just super playful and informative and just really, really fun way of expressing um, the natural world and world and, 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 and I connect with that quite a bit. Uh, she also co-founded uh, TLC uh, back in 1997 and still uh, spent a lot of time on the board but uh, right now she's teaching uh, at, the Deer Trails Natural, at the Deer Trails Naturalist program. Um, I just wanted to share some of her work here. Um, so I just wanted to share uh, a couple uh, um, images of Bryony's um, artwork in her nature drilling. I mean, anytime I'm, I'm out with her uh, or she's, she's joined us on some field work, she's got her, her pen or pencil and, uh, and journal book with her and she's always, always drawing something in there and it's, it's really exciting. <laughs> it's like she's got her, her notebook and I got my little camera. so. Um, these illustrations here are from uh, one of her books, actually, um, A Year on the Wild Side. And so she, through these illustrations, she put together a book um, just describing uh, the different little life cycles and stories of all these different animals that we uh, live alongside with and um, has shared that work um, with the community in different forms. So this is one of Bryony's uh, mandalas here. and. I really love this creative approach to, um, yeah, expressing the different um, plants as they come out throughout the year, and, and yeah, their interactions with each other. Um, 
these are actually posted as um, some uh, interpretation uh, signage in uh, our local parks. So um, this one here is at Uplands Park. So if you ever visit that park in, in Victoria, you can actually see this um, at the uh, trailhead. Um, this, this map here is a part of a community mapping program and uh, it's, I just wanted to share this because it's a different way of uh, nature journaling or expressing uh, nature journaling or, you know, uh, uh, the natural world uh, through a map and it's, it's just another visual way to, to connect us with that. Um, yeah, she's done a couple of these. I think they're really beautiful. Lynn Baldwin is a naturalist and ecologist and educator of the Kamloops area. Um, she, I met her through our Deer Trails Naturalist program. She was an instructor there and uh, shared her ways of nature journaling and that, that form of storytelling of place. And uh, I really recommend uh, you checking out her work. She's got a great book, but um, I'm going to start picking up books and showing you. <laughs> But uh, she's got a really beautiful book called Finding Place in Wells Gray, um, and this is what she shared with us. So I'll show a couple of slides um, out of that book there, and it kind of just gives you a different idea, or another idea of what nature journaling looks like and how that's expressed through different yeah, artistic uh, points of view. So this is just an example of some of her uh, journal work and uh, um, she, when we were up at Deer Trails, she shared that she actually uh, makes her own uh, books, which is another fun aspect of journaling. I mean, uh, to, to sometimes even make your own paper. I mean, you could totally do that, you know, make your own paper, um, bind your own books, you know, and even make your own inks out of pigments that you can find out in nature. Um, but it's just a really playful way um, to, to connect. There is one more naturalist I'd like to uh, share with you today, um, and that is Mary Oliver. And Mary Oliver, uh, who just recently passed away in 2019, she was born in 1935, uh, she was an American-born uh, writer, and her work focused mostly on the quiet occurrences of nature. And I invite you to read this, um, yeah, take a pause and uh, hit pause. And, uh, and, and read this poem and I, yeah, I extend that invitation for you to um, learn more about nature journaling and perhaps even trying it out. Um, and in the next two um, uh, sessions, I will yeah, guide you more on how you can delve into that. But uh, yeah, so Mary, uh, her poetry was award-winning, uh, including the Pulitzer Prize, National Book Award, and the Lennon Liter Literary Award for Lifetime Achievement. Um, her work has been described as visionary as Ralph, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And if you don't know who that is, uh, I recommend checking um, him out, as well as uh, Henry David Thoreau, um, who were philosophers and poets um, around that same era, who were, yeah, super, super uh, inspiring and incredible people who are very connected to the lands that uh, they lived upon. So that concludes uh, this first uh, session of my three-part series on nature journaling. I hope uh, this was interesting for you and you, t you know, learned a little bit of something, got a little bit more curious. Um, and if you are, please join me for the next two parts. Um, I promise <laughs> we won't be on a PowerPoint. I'm actually going to sit out in my backyard and uh, show you some different methodologies on how to nature journal and then... Um, and then the week after that, after um, we will, I'll show you some uh, exercises on how to get um, past that fear of the blank page, um, which is probably the most fun part <laughs> of all of this. So I look forward to um, connecting with you in the next week and two. Um, and if you want to learn more, uh, check out our website. And I will leave you with a couple of links here that um, I found interesting and uh, yeah, enjoy. <laughs>